people no longer bound by their non-disclosure agreements, what can you now disclose? My best friend worked at a roadside attraction near Chattanooga, Tennessee, called Ruby Falls. There's something else called Ruby Falls elsewhere in the country. It's supposedly a waterfall inside a cave. Of course, the trail to the cave is redone with all sorts of rock brought in from around the world. I think they've owned up to that part now. But the waterfall itself is barely a trickle naturally, and then only in the wetter season. They've run a pipe up there to supplement the falls, hidden by cracks and crevices and cemented over, and powered by a pump off to the side, which you can't hear when the water is splashing down from 100 feet overhead. It's 99% from the city of Chattanooga, or maybe Lookout Mountain, municipal water supply. Of course, with such a wet area, old electrical wires going back to the Great Depression, and 300 feet underground, it sputters, or shorts out and stops every now and then. The first rule in the falls room is make everybody leave immediately if the power goes out, not for safety, but because the fable agreed upon will be shown as fake. The book you're reading might only be a bestseller because the author had enough money to buy thousands and thousands of copies, to have them shipped to a warehouse for storage, and eventually destroyed. Always wondered how shitty books were on the New York Times bestseller list and who was buying them. When I was fired from Aunt Yan's in 2010, I signed a 10-year non-compete NDA contract, promising not to detail the baking secrets or work for another pretzel establishment. Well that ended this year so now I can run out and start a pretzel store because the secret I was keeping was making pretzels literally requires two products. One of them being water and the other a large bag of pretzel meal slash dust slash powder. Quite literally anyone with $2,500 can start a pretzel stand and make perfectly fine pretzels. It's not difficult whatsoever. I used to work for a large gas station chain. I worked at its warehouse where it creates a lot of the donuts. The room was really hot so we were always sweating. There's some machines where the donuts get glazed in chocolate. They're these small machines they look almost like a barbecue grill. They always wanted us to be super fast glazing the donuts. Working in a hot room and working at super fast speeds it was natural for a lot of people's sweat to just drip in the chocolate underneath us. Never eat the chocolate donuts from a gas station. McDonald's made me sign a NDA regarding a robbery that took place during a graveyard shift. They made me take a effing polygraph test because they thought my ex and I were involved due to the simple fact that I had stopped by the day to pick up some documents. I was a manager, I had business to do. F you, McMeada. Hell, the first day of my first job was at a Hardee's. We were robbed. It was really obvious my manager had set it up as there was over a grand in my register and she wouldn't swap out the till. Then when the robber was running off she yells out wait, you forgot this and gets the $50 and $100 bills from under the drawer. Then pretended to faint. After the police interviewed us they just left. She expected me to finish my shift and I just laughed and walked out never to return. I signed an NDA after negotiating a six-figure settlement with my mortgage lender. Back in 2013, the bank illegally sold my home while I was living there and making monthly payments. I discovered this when new owners evicted me and my three kids. At the time, I thought someone was trying to steal my identity, etc. I spent the next two years writing legal documents and had to represent myself in court. The bank owned every legit legal firm I contacted. Also, the first lawyer I hired took my last $7,000 and was promptly disbarred for misconduct with previous cases, I had no money, no home but I had a laptop, printer and access to the county court law library. We were about a week away from selecting a jury, when we came to a settlement agreement. In the end, each of my kids, now in their 20s, got an inexpensive new car and I live at the beach. Which bank? You ask? I can't tell you the name, 
but might I suggest that it rhymes with case. They settled because they were worried that if the case went to trial, it would become public. Then, everyone would know, for certain, that they had lied, cheated and swindled to steal homes from hardworking people. The bank would lose when no one took out new loans with them. Edit, I received a posting on my front door. I went to the eviction court and lost, because, technically the new owners paid for my house. I was given 7 days to move all my stuff, to live the 13 years, or face the sheriff. I had 3 kids. I didn't want the drama of handcuffs. So we packed and moved, then sought relief through the court system. I was a contractor for NASA. I still fully support the agency, but I was extremely bugged when I learned that each separate NASA center, for example, JPL, Kennedy, Ames, Goddard, hides many of its inventions and breakthroughs from the other centers so that when HQ is ready to assign a big mission, and a lot of dollars, to one center, they have a better chance to compete over the others. Look what we invented. Ames can't do this over there give us the next moon orbiter. The downside is that there is a ton of reinvention and duplicated efforts going on. Sometimes years of work go down the drain when another center does the same thing faster. My perspective was, you all work for NASA. Share knowledge, collaborate. I was frequently ordered to tone down anything revealing when speaking to other centers. I was once an IT contractor for a now defunct bureau within the Department of the Interior during the event Deepwater Horizon disaster. Since the department has its hands in offshore drilling, they were part of the response team and boots on the ground. Anyway, it's a little known fact that all the extra stress plus aging IT equipment during the first 48 hours after the blowout took their entire authentication and email infrastructure down. Active Directory and Exchange, for two days. There were also other weird glitches from offices around the US not related to the outage. A switch going out here, building automation there. It was a fucking disaster. This was, of course, after years of emails and documentation stating they were heading that way. I was directly involved with recovering that infrastructure and the aftermath of dissolving the Bureau which really wasn't anything special. They just became three different bureaus, got new email addresses, and continued on in their role under a new title. It's not an NDA. It's a secrecy agreement with DOD that elapsed after 25 years. I worked as a programmer for the US Air Force on the global USAF budget in 1979 through early 1981. There was a period of time after Reagan became a leading candidate, but before he won the election or took office. Jimmy Carter was a lame duck president, and many senior officers really, really hated him. During this time, the USAF had flown the B-1. Not the B-1A, not the B-1B. This was when it was just the B-1. People had spent a significant portion of their careers working on delivering the B-1 program. They really, really believed in the B-1 as a strategic long-range supersonic bomber. Jimmy Carter hated the B-1. He viewed it as a wasteful, unnecessary, bloated program designed to keep the builders afloat at the expense of the taxpayer. He had cancelled the project in something like 77. But a couple, flying examples were available, but never to see service. Raven loved the B-1. It was everything he loved about our military programs. Fast, sexy, high-tech, and better than anything the Soviets had. All of that being said, here's what happened. Jimmy Carter gave explicit orders that the only two? Not certain. B-1s currently flying be broken up into parts, the program completely cancelled, the engineering materials be archived at the Pentagon, and all funding ended. He wanted direct evidence sent to him that this had happened, in the form of pictures of the broken up aircraft. Ronald Reagan was informed of this order by sources in our organization. Reagan let it be known that Carter's order was absolutely not to be followed under any circumstances. Now, where do I come in? 
I was just this guy working on the IF budget. It was a top secret clearance. Mainly because any analyst could correlate money to named projects, both globally and on basis. So one day I am going over daily reports and I see this massive new expenditure for, I think? Right Patterson. It's not in the approved project list. It's not in the unapproved project list. So clearly, it has not gone up to Congress. Yet, the money is actually in the dispersal. So I go to my boss and I point it out. It doesn't belong there, so obviously it's a mistake. He agrees, and we reverse it. A couple of days later, all hell breaks loose when a general officer I had never seen before comes rampaging through the office demanding to know who shorted his funding. Now, at this point we get hauled into a room, sword to secrecy, and told to fund this maintenance project. What was the project? Pay a huge team of contractors to very carefully disassemble one of the B-1s, drag in parts from other aircraft, show it being crushed, and send pics to Carter. Meanwhile, reassembled the plane and hide both of them inside black hangars. And that was why Reagan was able to have the program restarted literally within days of taking office. The program was fully back online in 1981. Be careful if your pet needs specific shampoo supplied by a pet small pedorp groppy salon. Last I worked there. They weren't letting us order anything and we had to try to track down shampoos from other stores before they'd let us buy anything. Meaning if your dog needed hypoallergenic shampoo or you were paying for an expensive upgrade, it's very possible that some of the products were unavailable. Oftentimes we would have the Ferminator shampoo but no conditioner, and the conditioner is what reduces the shedding so we just have to use regular dog conditioner. We couldn't stop selling these packages because that's what they base our performance on. I was considered a bad salon leader cause I wouldn't push these products we didn't have. Also teeth brushing is absolutely useless there. It does not stop your dog's mouth from decaying at all and you'd be better off buying an enzyme toothpaste from your vet and brushing your dog's teeth every day. The toothpaste we had basically was just to make your dog's breath seem better for a little while. Oh and the reason a bunch of dogs died there is because people were likely not following the rules when handling dogs. Almost every salon I worked at had people like that. They aren't supposed to be kenneling your flat-faced dogs anymore because of it. They're also supposed to have a set of eyes on your dog at all time when they are tethered to the floor. Someone obviously neglected to do that a few months ago when that bulldog passed away. The training program their groomers go through is not very good either. They have four weeks to basically become full-fledged groomers and a week is spent on computers. There's never enough dogs to practice all of the cuts they should know. They also don't kick out trainees who repeatedly cut dogs. They try to normalize nicking dogs so they don't have to fire people, but there is no reason dogs should be getting hurt at a grooming salon if they follow the rules they're supposed to. The biggest problem is they barely pay anything to help you upkeep your tools and dull tools cause injuries. With what they pay people usually can't afford to sharpen most of their tools so you're stuck with the bare minimum. Hid the name more. I once had to sign an NDA to get a price on a printer for my sign shop. This was a printer that was only sold by one distributor, by the way, so there wasn't even any direct competition on this particular model. I think their gimmick was that if they make a really big deal out of giving you this super secret pricing that you'd be lulled into thinking it was really something special. We reused buffet-style food served in a cafeteria that we're supposed to compost and record as waste. The health inspector says anything that's left open buffet-style and serve yourself can't be taken back and repurposed because it's not monitored and could be cross-contaminated or many other things. Nobody should ever eat buffet-style if avoidable FYI, but the Fortune 500 company I worked for was unhappy about the money they were losing by composting the food so they make us keep it and reserve it later or repurpose it into soup or casserole or something. 
Personally I never did this and just waited for my boss to leave and compost the food but others I worked with were too worried about losing their jobs to go against orders. I didn't want to be fired but felt morally obligated to not feed people food that was meant to be garbage, so I just sneaky tossed it out when nobody was looking because I got paid really well there. We all had to sign NDAs saying we wouldn't tell the media or non-employees about recipes and procedures that covered leftover food and food waste. Eventually my boss discovered what I was doing and I stood up to him about not being willing to reuse garbage as food so we agreed that I just quit because while they could force me not to talk about it, they couldn't actually force me to do something illegal for my job and I was clearly refusing to do it. I used to do data analysis of revenue management for some big companies. Many companies have no clue about their data or their revenue streams. I'm talking several million dollars of revenue disappearing in the pipeline and no one knowing what happened with it, or even caring really. There were multiple times I had to inform clients that we had huge gaps in their costs and we needed to find the missing numbers somewhere in order to make our final reports correct and was met with the, paraphrased, reply, just sprinkle the missing costs over the existing one. We just want the final total to be correct. All the companies cared about if the amount of money they have at the end of the year is higher than at the beginning and anything that happens in between is inconsequential. I objected at first to my bosses, saying that what we were doing was incorrect, but they said to just do as the client said. In the end, I got disillusioned and whenever our clients came with requests that made no mathematical or logical sense, I just execute as requested and let their analysts figure out later that the analysis they paid six figures for was basically nonsense. I didn't care, because I had documentation of all their requests and my objections which were thoroughly ignored. I had a few cases where clients came back disgruntled several months down the line after some in-house analyst had done a deep dive of their date to and came up with objections that I had pointed out months before. I'd usually dig up the relevant emails and clear my name. My choice of action was to tell them to pound sand, but my boss is always bent over backwards for clients, so we'd have to do the cleanup I anticipated. In the end I learned most of our economy is held together by duct tape and wishful thinking. At most 10% of people working at big companies are competent and carry the bulk of the work and rarely are the competent ones the ones in charge. Edit. I want to clarify something for everyone who's talking about embezzlement and people lining their pockets. I can assure you that in the day two I was working on, this was very unlikely. The money streams I was analyzing went to other companies as costs, so if they had literally disappeared, someone would notice. This missing money was really just a case of utter incompetence. People just too lazy or stupid to properly keep track of what goes where. I'm sure that if we got all the data from partnering companies, we would eventually be able to track everything precisely. We were unfortunately limited to whatever data our clients provided and we would rarely get data from other companies as they're quite privy about sharing it with third parties. This rant was not about corruption but rather incompetence. My graphic designer best friend won my town's design the centennial logo contest, despite having never set foot in the town. I worked for the radio station, and just did an interview with one of the organizers, where he lamented that there weren't very many entries. So I called my friend and said, want in on this? He said, sure. As he lived on the other side of the country at the time, I spent the next day texting him photos of the town for inspiration. Anyway, when he won and they found out he was a professional graphic designer who lived on the other side of the country, they made him and me sign NDAs because the town was afraid people would think they brought in a ringer. I don't really want to reveal the name of the company, because I'm one of only three people who have worked for the company that can speak English well enough to formulate more than just basic sentences, the others being a high-level manager, and the CEO. The others still works the, 
And while I'm not interested in going back to work for the company, I don't really like burning bridges but here's the juicy gossip from the company. A majority of the software was jankily put together because the company refused to hire more developers. We would develop POP for features and functions, being told that we could rewrite it before implementing it. We would demo the POC and be told to integrate it straight into the project. We were never given time to refactor anything. The CFO, the CEO's sister, was constantly lying on expenses and spending huge amounts on the company credit card for frivolous stuff for her home, we thought. Turns out, she had left her husband with the dream of becoming an art dealer, spent all her savings on art that she couldn't flip, then used the company credit card to keep chasing her pipe dream. The company, without my knowledge, forged fake employment records to satisfy visa requirements. It wasn't until the government sent me a copy of the records when I got my visa, I realized that the head of HR, another sister of the CEO, has falsified that I worked for two years for our British investors company. I was massively oversold to native investors because I had the right skin color, and could speak the native language. I was sitting in meetings with the government and investors taking notes, while my company passed me off as their genius lead architect. I was a junior fresh out of university, who was essentially told that even though I had zero work experience as a developer, I'd now be building the project from the ground up. It was revealed to me, after working for the company for 18 months, that this was the CEO's fifth startup, and that he had essentially bled his parents dry to fund it all, until he could get alternative investments. In the two years I worked for the company, we lost roughly eight people because they were overworked and the HR was determined to bring the company back to its native roots in terms of working atmosphere. When I left the company, I stayed on for three months longer as a consultant, 4x monthly wage for three months was a bit too good to pass up, to train the person who was going to be replacing me, she came in on day one, and didn't turn up on day two. Apparently when they outlined all the roles I filled, and projects I was working with, she quit on the spot, because despite her experience, it was far too much work for her. They ended up hiring three people to replace me. Due to the native investors we have, and how they think, the company just sold it to the investors as scaling up, rather than trying to maintain output. The back-end system, which was pretty much the selling point of the product we were developing, was essentially stolen from Samyon's Git repo and slightly modified for our purposes. Not enough to not give credit, IMO. I outright refused to work on it myself, and left other developers to work on, I didn't want my name on that code. The huge boost in quality of our back-end was purely because we bought out the development of a smaller Chinese company. The CEO didn't bother to ask exactly where this group of four mid-twenties Chinese developers got it from, but it was far beyond their ability. I was living and working in a country where bribery of government officials, like those who oversaw our progress and signed off on our funding, was so common, the country had to implement massively strict laws. So when we had a government official come round, usually too to ensure that the evaluations were fair and unbiased, we were all conveniently called to go enjoy a lunch on the company dime, all prepaid up front. But what's even more unbelievable? Two employees have too much work and have to skip lunch, we looks like that's two prepaid lunches wasted unless two individuals who happen to be free for lunch would care to join us. Yeah we essentially would bribe the government officials with expensive meals in favor of receiving praise from them, and it was completely illegal. I had been instructed, on more than one occasion, to falsify progress so that the higher ups could show off new features in our software for current and future potential investors, I would say on average one in three of our investors were convinced to invest, based on a feature that didn't actually work, just a lot of smoke and mirrors. By the time I had left that company, I had enough evidence that would not only force the company to shut down but end up with a majority of top-level management and a few government officials being arrested. 
really left a sour taste in my mouth for working with startups. After I finished being a consultant, I started working for an NGO local to me. Lower pay, but I only work 6 hours a day, and office attendance is optional, currently outright banned with coronavirus. Edit, I have a million stories from the company, but most of them are interpersonal dramas so not massively interesting, but I'll update the post with any more I can think of. Edit 2, because this is all pretty common for startups in this country, I don't mind revealing that the company was running out of South Korea. Edit 3. A lot of people are asking me why I'm not reporting them to the government, and quite honestly it's due to my old co-workers, the high-level manager who was working outside his own country, living on the visa the company provide, to send money back to his family, or the older Koreans who would not find employment beyond minimum wage and driving taxis who are still putting their kids through school. The company sucked, but I don't think I could possibly put those innocent people through that struggle no need to name the company. You just described 500 of them. Well this is already public knowledge, and they forgot to have me sign an NDA anyway, but Savannah College of Art and Design's Ombudsman Sophia Bagnalai, the independent person who's supposed to represent students in cases of unfair treatment by the school, married one of the school's vice presidents to and is now Sophia Waleto. It's definitely a conflict of interest but she's still serving as independent ombudsman, and currently refusing to help students get any kind of refund now that all their classes are online and they don't have access to the expensive equipment their expensive tuition is supposed to be paying for. Edit, wow, this blew up. For anyone affected by SCAD whether it was the abrupt closure of the Hong Kong campus, financial burden, lack of access to facilities poor e-learning quality etc you do still have recourse even if the ombudsman may be working against you. SCAD's accreditation is up for review with Saxcock this year. Saxcock will accept written complaints mailed to their office. Link below. Make sure to include documentation. Things advertised by admissions, emails, financial statements etc that unfortunately, seems to be the only way to make them improve. Link in the description. Edit 2, sorry, I almost forgot. There were a large number of Chinese students who were accepted and given the standard due date for their enrollment fee of a few months but then, after the outbreak of COVID-19, received another email from your admissions rep demanding payment of the enrollment fee within three days. That is not okay. Whether you paid the fee or not, please take the time to file a complaint with Saxcock and send them that material, both the acceptance documents and the later email demanding payment in three days. I used to work for a construction company in rural Texas, and man we did so much shady shit. Honestly my boss was like the Joe Exotic of construction. Always calling us the N-word, cussing us out, threatening to fight us. None of our haul trucks could pass a state inspection because he was too cheap to fix them up. He never paid his taxes on any of the track hose. Anytime the tax man would show up, we would have to drive all the equipment deep into the woods to hide it. He always paid the offshore inspector off because he knew our shops couldn't pass inspection. We had mountains of scrap metal in the woods. Mountains of old oil buckets stacked in the woods. We had an old rail car in the back that was full of oil slash hydraulic slash transmission fluid. The cap was off so when it rained it overflowed and would just drain into the earth. I can't count how many times we would get some equipment in and he would tell us to dump the fluid into one of the ponds. We always had guys up there trying to sell drugs and shit. Telling you my three years there was wild. I used to work in fine dining in Oklahoma City. Cocaine. Cocaine everywhere. I've personally walked in on several NBA players over the years, face down in the Twite Girl. Come to mention it, I've seen several of them boinking other guests on the same bathroom counter that their teammates just did a line off of. Personally got to watch Harold Hamm sign his divorce check. $975 million is a whole lot of zeros in a small space. 
wild times indeed. Edit for those that may want more stories. I did get to see Lebrun covered in toilet paper. Hilarity ensued. Needless to say she was escorted out. I think I'm finally ready to let the world know my secret. If you've ever used Verisight, the loading spinners you see when the report loads aren't waiting for anything. People kept complaining that reports were coming back too fast, so it must not be working right, it doesn't take long to complete a few hundred Google searches simultaneously, so the loading spinner just makes you wait a few seconds longer so it feels like more is happening. So glad to finally get that off my chest. Bonus fact, edit, I also added applying phlebotenum, reticulating splines, and looking for cat memes as random loading messages, but they wouldn't let me do harassing at Ted Cruz on Twitter. <laughs>